KLRN presents the next hour of information concerning the San Antonio regional economy, which is important to all of us. It's that economy that shapes our jobs, our incomes, our homes, our families, and the future of our children. We've assembled a group of experts who work in this field every day. Stay with us for the next hour. I hope the information you will learn is useful to you in making your daily decisions. Well, we're blessed to have in this segment a couple of individuals who have their fingers on the pulse of the economy of San Antonio, and they do it with numbers and they do it with daily experiences working with the businesses of our city. They are Richard Pettis, the president of the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, and Tom Tunstall, senior research director at U for UTSA's economic development function. Tom, let's start with you because you're into the numbers every day. Give us a sense of where the San Antonio economy is in this period as the pandemic wears down. Where we were before the pandemic, how do those compare? Mm -hmm. Where might we have been without the pandemic and how do we get back on that trajectory? Give us some sense of that standing. Sure. And, and you know, initially uh, on or about April of last year, 2020, uh, you know, things took a huge nosedive because of the, the stay at home restrictions and all that. And we've seen uh, in the intervening months some rebounds. What's been, I guess, as interesting as anything, while there's a lot of pent up demand, uh, the sort of the comeback, if you will, hasn't been steady. It's, it's still fluctuated a lot. I mean, we see numbers where, you know, GDP growth is, is five, six, seven percent, and then the next month it falls falls back because of either supply chain issues or, or what have you. So it's been a fairly uneven road. Has it been uh, parallel with the trajectory of the pandemic itself? Uh, I would say so. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the uh, uh, with with the Delta variant, for Correct. example, Correct. Uh, that, that that was another surge. It was a setback. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, unfortunately, we are still not on the trajectory that, you know, we haven't caught up with where we would have been had we not had the pandemic. We, we are not there yet. Is uh, that is that job growth numbers or absolute size of workforce or? Well, it's uh, actually GDP. GDP. Yeah. GDP. So, yeah, which uh, is a uh, correlates with with workforce but you know isn't yeah they don't 100 percent sync up uh, as we get more productive for example we can do more with less with fewer people and things like that so. so do you see us on the path toward getting gdp to at least where it was before the pandemic and then a trajectory beyond that do you see a path hopefully next year i, I don't think we'll see it before then uh, but uh, i think a lot of people uh, including me are banking on next year kind of getting us pretty close back to normal but uh, in terms of economic activity. Now, yeah. I'm not sure we'll catch up to, again, the trajectory that we would have been on had COVID not occurred. Right. That may be 2023. But And the metric you, you're using for these comments is, is GDP, the gross speaking. domestic product of the area, well, economic output. Yeah, gross metro product, if you want to talk about San Antonio. Got but it. Sure. All right. Uh, Richard, you see the same numbers, but you see them in the actual companies and the faces of executives that you work with in the several thousand members that the yes. chamber has. Give us a sense of where you think they are. Well, I think there's still a lot of cautiousness in what they're doing. Um, as you've just heard from Tom, we're heading in the right direction, but the fear is another Delta virus or something sure. like that that could really push us back. But I'm seeing a lot of positive growth. I'm seeing people downtown again. You know, during the heights of the pandemic, downtown was a ghost town right and now we're getting back to what we are used to and that is people going to places and buying things and businesses opening you know we've had a spate probably henry of maybe 50 uh, ribbon cuttings for new businesses opening in san antonio in the last three months oh that's impressive so uh, we're headed in the right direction yeah. but i still sense this kind of and well, it's natural because yeah. this pandemic has been so yeah. unpredictable. And as you said, it's had surges. Uh, the Delta set us back and who knows what's ahead. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, with people uh, being remaining careful, yes. uh, we'll see the economic effects, which would be startups, yep. as you say, new hires, mm -hmm. hires beyond the earlier numbers, consumers out in the marketplace, maybe Christmas season will see some burst of economic activity. If I were to ask you each to look ahead a year, two years, three years, uh, and let's assume for the moment that the pandemic is, quote, under control, not over, 
It may be endemic and be with us like the flu for the long haul. Mm -hmm. Where do you see San Antonio? What, what, we'll start with you, Richard. What, what prospects do you see for the city? What's the thing out there that excites you that is possible? Well, what excites me is the opportunities that San Antonio holds for anybody that wants to come and put their mark in the ground. Mm -hmm. Those businesses that exist today and those that want to come. You know, there's going to be a lot of money sloshing around in the economy from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have our own bond in, in May that if, if it's successful, that is going to be opportunities for people to grow their businesses, to start businesses, uh, and to really plant that flag. So I'm very optimistic and very bullish on, on the future. I we were, we were one of the faster growing cities in the country uh, before the pandemic. Yes. And uh, we probably still are because others have been hurt worse by the pandemic and, mm -hmm. and the basic numbers are there for us and our location in Texas and part of Austin, San Antonio. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see that as the likeliest course for our economy? It's a growth economy. I do. Uh, I, you know, you'll uh, have a discussion with Lloyd Potter, the state demographer later, but uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, the population of Texas was growing by about a thousand people a day, half of them born here, half of them moving from somewhere else. Uh, those numbers may be down somewhat, but they're still, we're still seeing a lot of people come to Texas. My, my biggest concern, I think there's plenty of pent up demand. Uh, I think supply chains are going to be struggling for a, uh, at least a year and probably longer to kind of catch up. You see the Port of LA backed up. Uh, it's creating opportunities for Texas ports, actually, because of the upgrade of the Panama Canal. We may see some supply chain uh, diversions, if you will, to, to Texas uh, uh, companies, yeah. uh, Texas ports. Um, I think we're also going to see a, 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 a companies look at repatriating supply chains, uh, bringing them back either, if not to the US, then to Mexico or Canada, closer to. Closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank I apologize you. that we're as tight as we are, but we're trying to get the community with an overarching view of the economy. And you've helped us by virtue of your familiarity with the facts on the ground. Thank you very much. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. San Antonio is fortunate to have a diverse mix of existing industries, tourism, the military, biomedical, uh, a level of manufacturing, all of them have sustained us well over the years, but we're also fortunate to have some leading edge industries that will create the jobs of the future. It'll create a sense of momentum about how we participate in the sunrise coming national industries. We're fortunate today to have Charles Wooden, CEO of Geekdom, a legendary aggregation of technology in San Antonio, and Jim Persbach, the president and CEO of Port San Antonio, who's done a tremendous job of transforming a traditional industrial Air Force base into a platform for leading edge industries. So gentlemen, I'm looking to you to share with our audience today a sense of San Antonio's economic future. Um, Charles, if you could just give us a sense of geekdom and, and it as a base, but what you see beyond that. Yeah, so I mean, with Geekdom, our whole focus is to really help individuals who have ideas launch those into businesses. Right. Most of those being involved in technology or in helping empower them through technology. And so our goal is to build San Antonio one startup at a time and just give them the fuel that they need to grow from So there. give us a sense, how, how many folks do you have at Geekdom? So right now we have about 75 companies at various Are stages. Are you all in one facility? Yep, four, four floors in the RAND building. Right, and what are the, what's the range of types of companies? We have all sorts of types. They're not all just technology, but we do have some, you know, femtech technology companies. We have some AI companies, some, um, you know, cybersecurity companies, all within our space. What does it teach you about the future when you look at the pattern? Are they going to stay in San Antonio? Will they grow here? As you say, growing one business at a time. What, what, what's your sense of the future? I think the future is pretty bright. I think coming out of the pandemic, we've seen a very diverse group of individuals that have come working on ed tech, you know, uh, futures and all sorts of different things. And so I think that there's a bright future for technology here in San Antonio with a very diverse group of founders that are coming up out of our ecosystem. And it's really exciting. And I think you're going to start to see them grow out into the other areas that we find in San Antonio building up their ecosystem. You already well. have a record of firms leaving geekdom and, and moving into space elsewhere in the area economy. Yes, yes, for sure. I mean, we've got uh, hundreds of startups that have left Geekdom in the hundreds 10 years. Hundreds of startups. Yep, in the last 10 years oh, that we've impressive. been around. Great so. success. Mm -hmm. Now, Jim, you have a huge industrial plant out there that you have 
little by little, building by building, mm -hmm. transformed, and now have a major cybersecurity complex, but other areas as well. What are some of the areas that are growing? We've got people doing everything from robotics, cybersecurity, as you mentioned, artificial intelligence, supervised autonomy, space exploration, uh, advanced transportation, and critical infrastructure protection. Now, in the big picture, when we compare San Antonio to other places, we know that some of them had immense head starts and great educational uh, bases like Stanford and Silicon Valley. But how would you grade our progress at this stage? At this stage in the new economy, Correct. I think we are absolutely one of the leaders. You see, San Antonio has a huge advantage. The world never really changes. There's transportation, there's food, there's energy. All those are constants we need to live. Right. It's how you acquire them. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is more and more integration of new technologies. And in San Antonio, we've got a unique blessing. We've got people who truly understand the industries as they exist today. We've got people who understand the new technologies. And you bring those together. It's like the old chocolate and peanut butter commercials with Reese's. Now you've got the ability to make some amazing things happen. And this isn't just pretty talk. I mean, we're seeing it. On yeah. our campus alone, we've added over 5,000 jobs in four years. Yeah. We see that acceleration going on. We see things being done out of San Antonio that are life-changing. The medical pods over at Knight Aerospace, the space exploration with Astroport, and people are looking to San Antonio as being the leaders. Charles, what is the, what, what's needed to take this to the next level? From your perspective, the educational sector, more in migration of companies, capital availability, space, what are we what are we looking at? All of the above. I mean, I think education, the expansion of UTSA in downtown is going to be a huge contributor to the future of what our, you know, economy is going to be. The fact that they're focusing on data science and cybersecurity, kind of getting behind a couple things that San Antonio is very special for. And then I think collaboration between organizations like Port, Geekdom, Velocity, all sorts of these mm. kind of up and coming, yep. um, you know, spaces working all together to build the better city. Jim, your, your take on the single most important thing you would invest in? The single most important thing that I would invest in is inspiring people. You see, there's this concept out there that technology is hard, that industry is hard. It's only for the bright people. It's only for people who know STEM. Henry, we've got a wonderful community full of wonderful people. And some of the folks from the neighborhood are the people who've come up with these solutions that are making amazing things happen. But you have to inspire people and then provide that connectivity. And what I'm so excited about in San Antonio, we've brought 60,000 kids to our tiny little museum. Mm -hmm. With that new center, we're gonna bring a couple hundred thousand people through. I am so happy the two education. of you are on the job. And, uh, and I'm especially pleased today that you bring this optimistic view of what's possible in the future. We look forward to your continued good work. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Perhaps the industry that's been hit hardest by the pandemic and that we worry about as a community is our hospitality and tourism industry. It's been a backbone of our city and it's logical and obvious that it's been hurt badly by the pandemic. Yet people are struggling and working to bring it back. We're fortunate to have today with us Robert Thrailkill, chair of Visit San Antonio, which is the organization that was created to replace the Convention and Visitors Bureau and basically is the private sector leadership of our touristic industry. And also Michelle Madsen, who's president and CEO of the San Antonio Hotel and Lodging Association, which makes her the representative of all of the hotels and motels in our community. Robert, we'll start with you. Give us a sense for the pandemic at its worst. How serious was the blow? And where are we now? And then a sense also of your, your sense of the future, where are we headed? Well, the worst was probably in uh, April and May of 2020, when uh, a number of our hotels basically shut down. We mm -hmm. were completely shut down. Conventions Convention stopped hotels, bookings, uh, visitors stopped, stopped coming. coming. So that was, and for the first time in, in my case at the Hilton Palacio de Rio, uh, we shut down this hotel, a 52 year history, and we shut this hotel down for two months. And that was pretty much across the board downtown. So that meant losses to vendors, losses to employees, losses to the, the industry itself. That's right. That's right. Everything was 
And, and that was the case in many hotels well, across uh, the city? I'd say 95% of them. Right. Now, as head of Visit San Antonio, where do you see us today? Well, the good news is our leisure customers are back. Uh, they've came back with a vengeance, uh, especially over the summertime. Our parks uh, re reported record numbers. Really? Uh, our occupancy in the month of July was 74%. As now, an describe the, the logic of that. What was going on? Is it families who were saying, we can't go abroad, but we can go to San Antonio? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the good news is San Antonio has always been one of those destinations that families love to come to. Yeah. And we, we're a great drive market. So a lot of our visitors come from a 200, 250 mile radius right. surrounding our community. And so we saw a really pent up demand. But the convention business is still off. Convention business is still off. And, and that's and going to be for a while because they take a, a few years to plan ahead. That's correct. And, and I think they're still a little confused as to what jurisdictions are doing what, right? Mm -hmm. Every community is a little different. So right. they're struggling with that issue. I'll come back to you in a second because I, I'd like to get your sense of where you see this a year from now or two years from now. Michelle, uh, the properties. Uh, did we lose some properties outright that just stopped being hotels? There weren't a lot of shutdowns yeah. in terms of just properties closing and not opening back up. They, they shut down for a time period, as Robert mentioned. There were a lot of sales of hotels. There was a lot of changing of ownership. There's been a lot of changing of, of the flag, if you will, of the, the brand. Because um, the industry was disrupted badly. Correct. And yeah. because owners just couldn't continue mm -hmm. in some cases. But for the most part, I would say that our hotels have, have remained in operation. And what's the spirit of the ownership? Do people see these properties coming back? Are they intending to stay in the business? We're cautiously optimistic. Yeah. You know, summer was really, really great. Again, as Robert mentioned, we had a wonderful leisure, leisure travel travel season. And what, so, what occupancy would you have had, say, this last year? We had 74% occupancy in July, which was only 3% down from that same time period in wow. 2019. And what was it at the worst of the pandemic occupancies? I mean, the worst of the pandemic was single in the digits. in the single digits. Single digits. Single digits. Single digits. Things that I've never seen before. Things mm -hmm. that are hoteliers that have been in the business. So our our strong period for family travel is summer, and you had seventy four percent. What's the strongest period for convention activity? Is it spring? I would say it's. Uh, we rely on it in the fall and in the and spring. And the spring. And what percentage of our of our usual number are we of that? We are probably, I would say, at. Occupancies. Fifty percent. Fifty percent. Fifty percent. Okay, so both of you, and I'll start with Robert and come back to you. Going forward, give us your best shot at where we're headed. Well, I think twenty-two will be better than twenty-one. Right. Uh, we're looking at about a fifteen percent improvement over mm -hmm. twenty-one numbers. However, our convention business won't be back in in uh, pre-pandemic numbers probably until twenty-four. So we've got some so San Antonio to... really can't be back until our convention business is back. It's that important I agree. to our economic base. Absolutely. It's the third largest industry here in, in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. and employees... You see any permanent damage in the sense that conventions say we found a different way to meet and communicate with our people? And... Maybe some of that, but for the large portion, it's important that these uh, associations and, and, and groups meet. They like to do people-to-people -people -people interactions. Right. And so I think that they'll be back in full force when they Michelle, what's your take looking ahead? Again, it's it's a completely new ball game. People yeah. have figured out that that virtual is an option, but yeah. I do think that people also want to meet again. People like interacting with each other. They like coming to conventions. They like experiencing the city that they're going to. And so I think well, it will come back. It will take time. I think it's clear that we will come back earlier than most touristic places because San Antonio has those advantages you Absolutely. mentioned, the travel distance, the family attractions, the diverse reasons why people come and use our hotels. Good luck to both of you. Your work is critical to our entire city. We depend on you. Thank you. Thank you. Kayla has done the community a service in pulling together the leaders of the major universities in San Antonio for the purpose of talking about how those institutions contribute to the future San Antonio economy. We have with us today Dr. Taylor Amy, the president of UTSA, former councilwoman Rebecca Villagran, uh, who is in charge with community partnerships and workforce development at A&M San Antonio, and Dr. Mike Flores, the chancellor of the very extensive Alamo Community College District, which is at what, 60,000 plus 65,000 65, students? 65,000. Students now. 
We'll start with Dr. Amy, uh, who heads a university of 36,000 students. Very impressive, the growth there. Uh, Dr. Amy, you've got a good sense from your previous positions, but also now these years as president of UTSA, of San Antonio's economy and the role of UTSA within it. If you could focus on some of these lead sectors like cybersecurity and uh, what you're doing in the uh, computer and data sciences uh, to, to prepare this economy for the future. Sure, uh, and what's, what's great about being here, it's good to see you, Henry, and it's good to see my colleagues. We all work very closely together. We all have the same common mission. We're all interested in educating young people. Education is the great equalizer, but we're also all collectively interested in our young people uh, coming out of our programs prepared to work in the economies here in San Antonio, and we want them to join our workforce, stay here, have appropriate, wonderful compensation along the way, and we want to grow our, our community in this fashion. So we're all in the business of this. We were, I think all four of us were on the, the, the regional economic de development plan that was brought forward by now greater SATX. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of focus on, on e economic sectors we wanted to go after as a, a community. And we have intentionally at U UTSA really focused on growing data science and cybersecurity. These are great strengths for us. And these kind of cross cut all five of the targeted economic sectors that were brought forward in this plan. Taylor, say a word about um the cybersecurity, because the words roll off the tongue and a lot of people hear it in San Antonio, but explain what it is exactly to the layperson. Yeah, the, the, the idea uh, or the concepts behind cybersecurity involve the protection of information from external attacks to, 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 to get access to that information. So it typically involves defensive measures about protecting information and having robust security Hugely systems. Hugely important in the economy. To every, every aspect and of San our economy. And San Antonio has emerged as a center. Well, truth and, is, and I've heard it said UTSA is arguably the best cyber program educationally in the country. That is true, and we are situated in probably the largest cyber ecosystem, cyber national security ecosystem outside of Washington, D.C. here mm -hmm. in in San Antonio by virtue of the presence of the 16th Air Force and right. of NSA Texas. So we're, we're right in the middle of this wonderful hub yeah. and who wouldn't want to take advantage of that ecosystem about our supply side producing young people from our, our programs yeah. who are trained in cyber and data science and information technology, having them prepared to enter the workforce, but at the same time, all of us collectively working to grow our economy is about this and bring bring here, grow here, attract here companies that focus on cyber and national security and data science. Hold that thought because I want to come back to you in a bit with other areas that you see going forward will have that kind of prominence. Sure. Uh, former Councilwoman Rebecca Villagran who did a great service for our community on the council now advising Dr. Cynthia Matson at A&M on matters related to community partnerships. Rebecca. I know that there have been some breakthroughs recently at A&M. For example, the decision to purchase land for a regional hospital from the county hospital system. Very important to the south side, but also important with A&M because it will be a teaching facility and add to the, to the, to the quality of clinical and, and academic medicine on the south side. What other things are at work at A&M that, that focus on the workforce opportunities. Thank you very much uh, for having having me, and I'm proud to work with a wonderful president, Dr. Cynthia Teniente Matson, and to be here with our colleagues at, uh, around the city. Um, yes, the hospital is extremely important, and as we continue to plan for the future, we are already growing our life sciences department and our laboratory research, so we can have that trajectory for um, preparing to have this regional this regional hospital, the first of its kind in Bear County, the only one south of Highway 90 from the county. So it's extremely important. And as we know that where we are situated, the university, we are in uh, equity index seven, eight, and nine. And we are trying to also address health inequities What does that, that mean exist. exactly, it's equity index seven, eight, and nine? So the city of San Antonio has an equity index that looks at where the lost opportunities, um, race, um, income, and where there hasn't been that opportunity for educational attainment in 
in the past. So we all know that talent is universal, universal opportunity is not, and we are trying to ha make this um, a part of the opportunity to have this regional hospital. I, I know that I know that uh, Dr. Matson initiated something extraordinary, which is the Aspire Network of Southside Schools yes. that A&M is taking an interest in. Mm -hmm. That is clearly a linkage between higher education, uh, public schools, and and the economic prospects for the for the for the area. Yes. Can you say a word about that? Absolutely. This is another first of its kind partnership with the seven South Bear County uh, independent school districts. So Texas A&M San Antonio, we are now having schools within all of these southern sector school districts right. and allowing the community share with us, the university, what are the needs and mm -hmm. what is the collective impact. So it's, it's kind of an adoption of those schools? Ab absolutely, mm -hmm. but it's more that we can have a collective voice together and speak together to make that impact. What are the needs of Edgewood ISD and what are the needs of Harlandale ISD right. and how can we unify the voice to make well, a larger impact? There's, there's no better example of, of, of linking up with community needs than that. Although the community college uh, has really turned the corner and uh, Mike, under your leadership and, and, and Dr. Leslie before you, uh, has gone to the front ranks of community colleges in the country. The Aspen Prize that you got a few years ago. Uh, and now, uh, traditionally I've heard of Maricopa and Dallas and, and Dade County as the leading community colleges and there's now the Alamo colleges right on the front rank. Uh, you're also <laughs> deeply involved in the uh, uh, Ready to Work initiative, right. $154 million, which is unlike anything this community's ever had before for workforce training. Tell us something of your philosophy and direction for the community college. I think, um, Henry, one of the wonderful things is that the community leadership has articulated key sectors that we should invest in. So um, as you've heard, uh, IT with an emphasis in cybersecurity, healthcare, uh, bioscience, aviation, aeronautics. So our, what uh, we need to do then is be able to connect that. So how do we connect opportunity to those key sectors? Uh, all of us at the Alamo Colleges are seeking to do that, to ensure that our 65,000 students have a path to the middle class, to high wage, high demand jobs. Being able to do that at scale at any one of our five colleges, uh, which are nationally ranked and represented, as well as our regional centers throughout Bear County and the surrounding area. Um, so, so that is the key for us. If we were to look at healthcare in particular, frontline workers, right, coming out of the most recent 20 months, we have a need for 4,000 just nurses, particularly in that field. Um, and we train just at the Alamo Colleges um, about uh, close to 2,000. So how can we close that gap to provide opportunity in one sector, in one position, and then expand that to the other key sectors? Mike, on your watch, you've initiated some high-profile things like the Alamo Promise. Yes. Can you define that quickly for the uh, audience? The Alamo Promise provides opportunity to all graduating high school seniors within Bear County. It ensures that you um, have scholarship, a scholarship paid for. Uh, one of the things is we've already enrolled about 5,000 students, um, and this is our third year of implementation. Mm -hmm. I mentioned healthcare earlier, 44% of Alamo Promise scholars are actually in STEM. So if we look at the ways we can effectuate change in particular, I think that's a wonderful proof point. Let me, uh, as we wind down here, uh, ask each of you if I were to ask you what is the next big thing you have on your agenda related to the economy. I'll just ask each of you in, in sequence to say 15 seconds on what that is. Mike, what would, what's the next big priority for you? I, I think that it is uh, being able to connect our students to opportunities. So our largest natural and untapped resource are 65,000 students. So how can we link theory to practice and provide each of them with a significant experience before they get their credential? Got it, very important. We have launched uh, something tied to our accreditation as a four-year doctor, doctoral granting institution. It's our classroom to career initiative, and we have the, a plan to bring forward where 75% of our undergrads will have some form of experiential learning, including Fantastic. paid internships, because we're sitting here in the seventh biggest city in the United States. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we want to work on having our young people intern 
with companies that they can go and work for Got after it. they graduate. Rebecca. So our next big step is to continue to build on our advanced <coughs> manufacturing hub, global supply chain logistics, and getting our students connected to their employers sooner in their college career. Those are wonderful, wonderful stories. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, more importantly, for the work that each of you does uh, and your institutions in preparing our region for the future. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Catch up with colleagues. Thank, Thank you. you. Judge, thank you for coming to KLRN for this special that KLRN is putting on with respect to the San Antonio and regional economy, economic development, job creation, future prospects. And you have an unusually good perspective on this because you've been the county judge for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And as the newspaper recently said when you announced your retirement, the most effective, impactful public official in modern San Antonio. And I know that to be true. So your, your uh, opinions are exceedingly valuable. Give us a sense, given that you were a business person before and you've been very close as mayor and county judge to the local economy, what's the most important dynamics we've seen in the 20 years that you were county judge? An assessment of where San Antonio was and where it is today in that period. Well, let's go back a little bit further. When you were mayor in the 80s, uh, you began to take an interest in creating jobs. That was really the beginning of city government getting involved in the economy and it's exploded since then uh, with the strong economic development programs with incentives with uh, all the inner city work that's been done technology city the county also since i became county judge created an economic development department mm -hmm. we've been very active in, in economic development focusing on manufacturing uh, so the two uh, governmental entities in san antonio transformed in the last 20 years, supporting Economic Development Foundation, and really became aggressive in creating jobs. And I think that was a big turning point for our community. So what would you say have been the impact for the people of the region in those 20 years that you've been watching as well, county judge? Well, if you go across the spectrum of what makes up an economy, we've got a very diverse economy. Uh, we put a tremendous amount of money into our health care industry, particularly Bear County has over a billion dollars into new facilities for our hospital district, and that's just exploded. Uh, when you look at the fact that tourism was hurt by the pandemic, but again was a major impact, and now we're doing a major renovation of the Alamo and a new museum, which would really begin to prop up that industry. Technology we've got a much stronger technology industry than most people think. I was out at Tower Chip Company the other day. They got 660 people out there making chips, which everybody needs mm -hmm. for automobiles and other appliances, and they're looking at a major expansion. And, 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 and again, manufacturing is so important. So we really diversified over these last 20 or 30 years and much stronger uh, diversified And economy. that translates into jobs, incomes, movement to the middle class, movement into better neighborhoods. That's the dynamic of this period. We've seen our personal income grow over those years, right. our family income grow, more prosperity. Obviously, we still have a problem with a certain segment of our population that we've never been able to get educated properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we've come a long, long way from where we were, particularly going back to the time when we were just strictly living off of the military. Right. What are you proudest of in terms of your economic development accomplishments? There have been many, and as you said, you almost single-handedly willed the county into an economic development role that it never ever had before. It was jails and the indigent hospital and uh, corrections facilities, et cetera, sheriff's office, but nobody ever thought of the county as an economic development player. What have you accomplished personally? Well, number one, I think the biggest turn in our economy toward better paying jobs was Toyota. You may remember you laid some groundwork back in the 80s when you opened up the gates to Japan and took a trip there. We worked hard on it. I led that effort to bring Toyota here. Uh, and here we are now with 7,000 people working out there, 400 and some odd more million dollars invested. That led us to bringing Navistar here, a truck manufacturing yeah. plant, and it will start up in January. So I believe that was one of the turning points for our economy. 
getting back to manufacturing with this country lost. Mm. And now we see that as a thriving part of our industry. You've also invested in the infrastructure of our area, including some of the infrastructure that has made uh, growth in new neighborhoods and 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 recreation the the river walk improvements all the way to the mission reach for example the in improvements at the hospital district those would fall among your economic development achievements as well, well let's just I take see. the inner city we were pretty much a hollow hollow hole except for tourism when people living downtown wasn't a lot of people working downtown uh, i think it all began with the river going north then we took it south it really was a transforming project. I think one of the greatest in the nation was the Pearl. Uh, that was unbelievable uh, urban environment. And now we see, I, I believe we're close to something like 10,000 housing units in the center city now yeah. that we never had before. We invested in the San Pedro Creek, which is now booming along. Uh, so yes, the public investments led to the private investments in the center city as well as the incentives that we gave to developers to, to, to do it in the center city. Ch changed, completely changed the center yeah. city. We know from, from history that sometimes a public official's accomplishments are based on circumstances they didn't plan. Yeah. And in recent years, the pandemic has dominated all of the thinking about our government locally. And you, of course, uh, had those nightly broadcasts that were very confidence inspiring and guided people in serious ways. What'd you learn from the pandemic? What, what did it tell you well teach I you. hope the overarching thing we learned and it will carry forward I hope that this pandemic was about us and not me that we had to get work together to get through it to manage our way through that pandemic we had to be respectful of each other in terms of using safety protocols not only to help yourself and your family but others from getting COVID so I think that's one of the lessons that came out of it, and hopefully we'll carry over uh, I think there's good indications it would. During the uh, pandemic, the mayor, Nuremberg, went to the voters. Seventy-some-odd percent supported raising taxes to be able to do better job training. So I think we are coming together as a community, and I think that's probably the greatest lesson we learned from COVID, that it takes us working together to get through any major crisis or to take our economy, our city, to another level. Uh, as you approach uh, the last year of your service, because you will serve for another year until January of 23, uh, when your successor is sworn in, what would you say to the community that they can use in making judgments about the kind of person that ought to succeed you? What, what advice along the lines of work yet undone in the economic sphere that needs to be done. Yeah, well, for, first of all, I think we've got four good commissioners there that are gonna add a great deal of stability to, regardless of who gets selected for a county judge. But I would hope that that county judge keeps up the progressive nature of Bear County. What we've done in managing our, our government, the more streamlined managing, uh, public information officer, economic development, community development, all of the things that we did that were never done before. Even the county manager was a new concept. And the county manager, we were in the first counties to have a county manager and streamline government. I hope they will stay with those principles and then uh, continue to be progressive and be out front as an effective county government. In terms of specific initiatives that, you know, if you were around another four, eight years, you would, you would have prioritized. Is it the hospital district and the regional hospitals that they want to build? What, what, what is it? Well, we're, we've got on the books two more community hospitals. I would love to see uh, what we can do with Texas A&M. Uh, we bought uh, several acres of land out there. A&M is looking at creating their medical training programs, and we could be a good partner with them. I think that offers up a, a great, a great, great opportunity. I believe the completion of the, working on the completion of San Pedro Creek, we see economic development happening mm -hmm. all the way along that creek. And I hope the county will focus, and that's what we're doing now, focus on manufacturing jobs. We're building a large training center in a partnership with the private sector. To me, if we focus on manufacturing, that be, really be the groundwork for tremendous, uh, good paying jobs as well as taking our economy to another level. Well, Judge, I, I think I'm being honest and accurate when I say the many, many projects that have advanced San Antonio and this region have your hallmark, your signature on them, uh, and you have had an extraordinary run. 
I hope you have an extraordinary retirement as well, and I know you will, because between your writing and your uh, advising and, and activism in the community, you and Tracy both, uh, you can, you're going to continue to do a lot of good. We'll, we'll keep active. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming Thank over you, to Taylor Randy. Thank you. Thank you. In this discussion of the economy of San Antonio, it is clear that the economics of the region are shaped by our demographics. That is to say, economics is based on people, their uh, economic standing, their jobs, their incomes, family size, all of those dynamics. We're fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Lloyd Potter, who heads the Institute for Demographic and Socioeconomic Research at UTSA. But perhaps more importantly, for the purposes of our state, he is the Texas state demographer, which means he's the person who experts look to for demographic analysis of Texas. And that's particularly important in a year when we're getting the census results. Dr. Potter, thank you for joining us. And give us a sense for the key demographic indicators that tell us the sort of status of San Antonio today that a demographer would acknowledge and, uh, and some sense of what the pandemic meant for that. Okay, um, sure. Well, San Antonio is the seventh largest city in the country, and that's one thing that most people, when you hear San Antonio, you're not thinking, oh, the seventh largest city in the country. Um, it's the third largest uh, in the state. So we have Houston and, and Dallas, certainly as um, more long, um, larger states and larger cities in terms of the state. Uh, but, but San Antonio is a very substantial city in terms of population. It's also extremely diverse. Um, you know, we have a majority Latino population in, in San Antonio and in Bear County. Um, and we've been growing a lot as well. I mean, we're one of um, the most significant growing cities and one of the most significant growing counties. Can you in the tell country. whether the pandemic flattened that growth trajectory that we were on before? Um, we don't really have that because there's a lag behind yeah. uh, the, some of the demographic data. We do know that probably there's been some impact on fertility as a result of the pandemic. Uh, Mag in migration? And probably some, certainly on immigration, we've seen some significant declines mm -hmm. or standstill in terms of immigration, mm -hmm. meaning people moving from other countries. Domestic migration we've seen, I think, is probably slowed, but it's not come to a standstill. Is it but, possible that it will accelerate because of the pandemic? People living, leaving places that they just didn't enjoy their way of life during the pandemic and want to try a newer, faster growing place? Well, pro that's probably not, wouldn't be the driver, but it would probably be economy. I mean, yeah. basically people that are domestic migrants are moving for employment Follow the jobs. Right, and that's what Texas and San Antonio and the Bear County region kind of really have going in our favor. Now, is the San Antonio place in Central Texas tied to Austin, as some have projected, uh, a giant sort of central Texas megalopolis of Austin, San Antonio to get. Do you see that as a as a likely direction? Yeah, it's kind of moving. We're moving in that direction. Um, it, in terms of cen the Census Bureau, they look at migrate, um, commuting patterns, um, and the commuting patterns earlier this decade weren't there to where they would consolidate Austin and San Antonio in a consolidated uh, metro area. Yeah. But certainly if you look at Hayes County, Correct. Um, which is New Brunfels, and Comel County, which is San Marcos, those were the fastest growing counties in the country last decade. Right. So that whole area, the whole I-35 corridor is just filling in very, very quickly, largely with domestic migrants, and there's employment opportunities there that are drawing them. And do you uh, make uh, anything of the Texas Triangle, Dallas-Fort Worth in the north, Houston in the southeast, Austin-San Antonio together in the southwest corner of the triangle as a realistic indication of urbanizing Texas? Yeah, without question. Um, it, you know, probably over 70 percent of our population is within that, mm -hmm. uh, re that triangle. Um, and that's where all the economic activity is. Texas added almost 4 million people over the decade, and the bulk of those were going to be our 
we're in the, t the population and triangle. as we said before where the people are is where the economics are correct and the uh, latest numbers I've seen show about 77 percent of the GDP of Texas is produced in that triangle mm -hmm. alone yeah so there's no question Texas is becoming more urban and uh, we're going to need the services of the Texas bi uh, demographer more and more <laughs> I guess so thank you so much for uh, gracing us with your presence today okay thanks for having yeah. me Mayor, thank you for joining us, and uh, congratulations on your excellent work over the last years, uh, especially the leadership you provided during the pandemic. Um, now that the pandemic is, one would say, in controllable range, and we never know what is ahead, but it does at least give us the opportunity to think in terms of something other than the crisis, something other than the emergency and focus on the long haul. Tell us about your kind of views of where San Antonio is economically at the end of the pandemic and what are the highlights of what you see ahead? Sure, well, like so many other communities across the country, I think the pandemic was a moment of clarity on the things that uh, underpinned our economy before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so what I see for the next several years moving forward is that San Antonio is going to be very intentional about an economic recovery. Our focus is rebuilding, just like so many other cities and the nation as a whole. Uh, and what that means for San Antonio is addressing uh, the severe shortages in skilled workforce. Uh, we know that San Antonio has uh, struggled over the years with poverty, with generational poverty, and that has grown exponentially. Uh, it ties to so many other social issues, such as health outcomes, socioeconomic um, segregation, things like that. But it also underpins uh, the challenges we've had in growing wages and ultimately growing the number of businesses and the businesses that are already here. So what we're focused on now is uh, retraining and skilling a workforce for us to be competitive in the future. One of your great accomplishments of the last few years has been the passage of that $154 million training initiative. We never had resources like that to apply to training. How is that coming? Is it, is it what you expected? Absolutely, it is going very well. Uh, obviously any new program uh, that's scaled at this size, particularly during the middle of a pandemic, takes a little bit of time to get off the ground. But we've had now uh, almost 9,000 people uh, start the intake process, several thousand enrolled in, in the job training program, short and long-term training, and uh, thousands of folks now entering new careers in San Antonio. It's, it's an extraordinary program. And what's interesting to me, I just came from St. Louis where we were uh, doing some economic development work, and every community that is interested in rebuilding and restoring and ultimately lifting up their economy post-pandemic is arriving at the same conclusion, and that is that we have to focus on making sure our workforce is yeah. prepared for the jobs of the future. You're absolutely right. And yet, the other side of the equation is continue to get new industry and new jobs created here for that workforce. That's right. What have been some of the breakthroughs of recent years and what are you most optimistic about going forward? Well, starting in your time and certainly has accelerated in the last 30 years, San Antonio's economy has, has diversified. And one of, our leading uh, one of our leading employers now is in the advanced manufacturing space, but we have advanced manufacturing. And that, we have the, the Toyota is a, is Toyota, a part of that. Toyota, our aerospace right. uh, companies, even biotech. biotech. Right. Uh, bioscience is one of the leading employers in San Antonio, cybersecurity and IT. Some of the emerging industries here in San Antonio that are employing the most uh, San Antonians are also high-wage, high-demand careers, but also leading the world. Do, are we going to have a place in uh, artificial intelligence? Do you, do you see any efforts educationally or otherwise to pick up some jobs in that arena? I do. There's uh, quite a bit of STEM education going on right now. There's a lot of robotics programs and computer programming that intersects in AI. And also, that is underpinning the growth of our advanced manufacturing communities, where um, it's less about the um, uh, traditional manufacturing job and more about the, the scientists and technicians that can control and, and develop those AI programs. A, a traditional role for local government is to build the infrastructure that makes that kind of both uh, human resources and economic development possible. Uh, what are some of the highest priorities you see on the horizon for 
infrastructure. I know you have major initiatives in the airport. For That's example. right. Well, transportation is a huge space, and as you know, we uh, are growing our, our alternative modes of transportation, but one in particular is air service in San Antonio. It's been an Achilles heel mm -hmm. uh, for generation here in San Antonio, and we are unveiling, in fact, discussing right now uh, and in implementing a airport redevelopment plan. It's a roughly $2 billion complete makeover of the San Antonio International Airport that will add airfield capacity, new gates and terminals, and ultimately may allow us to be competitive in international air travel, especially where we're already a leader, and that is to Latin and South America. Do you see our location in Texas, and particularly our relationship with Austin, as part of the way you think about Central Texas and San Antonio's place in it. I do, and I think it's a, it's a uh, economic truth that uh, San Antonio Austin corridor is uh, the fastest growing metropolis and probably the next megalopolis in the country. And embracing that and benefiting that, prospering from that as a community means working in conjunction with all the other municipalities in the region, particularly the other node, and that is Austin, attracting jobs and growth by the work that we're doing with Austin in conjunction with them, and viewing this entire corridor as one economic organism rather than two separate cities always competing. Mayor, thank you very much for giving us a sense of the economic future and the way you see uh, the city of San Antonio and your role personally in developing that future. Keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having joined us for this last hour of discussion of the San Antonio regional economy. Very important to all of us. We've been joined by experts who work in this field every day, and hopefully their insights will prove useful to you. You can watch this program anytime on klrn.org. Again, Thank you for joining us and join us again for special KLRN programs.